like the last few years in the first half of this decade. 1982 is bolstered by the presence of a few unsaleable classics at the top of the bill, with a lineup that is then filled in by showy slasher sequels and Strange Affair, for a pretty strong lineup overall. The films here range from the genuinely disturbing to shameless gimmickry, and with that, we present to you the 10 best horror films of 1982. It doesn't have Michael Myers, it doesn't have Sam Loomis, it wasn't directed by John Carpenter, and Season of the Witch is still one of the better entries of the Halloween franchise. In the film, an insane toy maker attempts to kill as many people as possible during Halloween through an ancient Celtic ritual involving a stolen boulder from Stonehenge and Halloween masks. Overacted and generic in some parts? Sure. But the first step in appreciating this film is to accept its inherent cheesiness and perhaps ignore the Halloween 3 part of its title altogether. The next step is to embrace the storyline and all its anti-children, corporate, America-hating, nihilistic glory. You can keep your Michael Myers, tense plotting, and minimalistic aesthetics. Give us melting heads, screaming men with mustaches, and the catchiest jingle this side of a Meow Mix commercial. Stop it! 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 Whenever we want to prove that we as horror fans don't immediately recoil at the thought of remakes, we inevitably point to The Thing, The Fly, and The Blob, the trinity of 80s updates that are defensible on many grounds. One frequent refrain insists that they were justified due to the advancements in effects and Hollywood's leniency with what those effects can now show compared to their relative prudish ancestors. Perhaps we shouldn't lump Paul Schrader's cat people in with those three? But it certainly benefits from the same thing. Even though the Val Luton original was a salty allegory for femininity and sexuality, he and director Jacques Tourneur could only go so far. For example, they couldn't also make it a story where a creepazoid brother needs to bone his own sister in order to ward off an ancient curse, which is exactly where Schreider took the material. Though, to be fair, to suggest that Schreider was simply concerned with amplifying the exploitation is a little reductive and facetious, but you get the point. A burnt out New York police detective teams up with a college psychoanalyst to track down a vicious serial killer, randomly stalking and killing various young women around the city. The New York Ripper was banned in many countries and only shown in adult cinemas and others for clear reasons. It features some heroin and unflinching depictions of physical violence against women. The killer is fond of using edge blades to savagely cut at women's abdomens and chests, especially in a key scene that will make any boob lover cringe, the slicing of a nipple and breast with a razor blade. Director Lucio Fulci doesn't pull away from the violence. He lets it fill up the entirety of the screen. By today's standards, some of the prosthetic torsos used to create the kills look quite phony, but the breast mutilation and eye trauma remain as convincing today as in 1982. <laughs> The third chapter of the Friday the 13th saga was where the direction got a bit more audacious, thanks in no small part to the film being released in 3D, which had seen a resurgence at the time. Everybody has their favorite moment, whether it's watching a kid take a machete to the crotch or the moment where Jason dons his infamous hockey mask for the very first time. As far as Fridays go, you can't go wrong with this one. Third time was definitely the charm. <laughs> Possibly the ultimate 42nd Street exploitation movie experience, Basket Case, a film made for the cost of a car, captures all that scuzzy NYC ambience that's as extinct as the dinosaurs these days. Two Siamese twin brothers, one human and the other looking like a mound of pizza dough with teeth, look up the doctors that literally separated them for some messy surgery of their own. <laughs> Legend 
legendary Italian horror director Dario Argento's Tenebre was his return to Giallo after a series of fantasy works. Facing endless criticism and questions about his perceived misogyny and love of brutally violent scenes, the film is a playful middle finger to his detractors. Peter Neal, a successful American murder mystery author, visits Rome to promote his new novel, Tenembre. Shortly after his arrival, a string of murders takes place that seemingly imitate scenes from the book. Beautiful women with their throats slashed by a cutthroat razor are discovered, and Neil becomes involved in a spiraling descent into murder and mystery, as yet more deaths occur and he begins to receive letters from the killer. A single mother in Los Angeles is assaulted and tormented by an unseen presence, and things just get more out of control from there. None other than Martin Scorsese considers The Entity to be one of the scariest films of all time, and it's easy to understand why he feels this way. The film bluntly confronts the idea that is suggested by so many horror films, but seldom spelled out, that the attack of the obligatory monster is willed by its victims, that the horrible being is an external manifestation of internal torments. Another good example of this is Jennifer Kent's The Babadook. Here, there are legitimate terrors. Legitimate because they come from a real and terrible place. And for those who enjoy at least some defiance of natural laws, the entity has that too. DC Comics, to those who weren't aware, was a force to be reckoned with in the 1950s. They had such titles as Crime Illustrated, Weird Fantasy, and Shock Illustrated. What they were best known for, and ended up getting in trouble for, were such titles as Tales from the Crypt and The Vault of Horror. It is within these horror comics that the Stephen King and George Romero found an inspiration for the anthology film Creepshow. Five tales of terror are presented. The first deals with a demented old man returning from the grave to get the Father's Day cake his murder and daughters never gave him. The second is about a not too bright farmer discovering a meteor that turns everything into plant life. The third about a vengeful husband burying his wife and lover up to their necks on the beach. The fourth is about a creature that resides in a crate under the steps of a college. The final story is about an ultra rich businessman who gets his comeuppance from cockroaches. Everyone has a favorite moment, let us know yours. Ah, oh. oh. oh, teach me to throw away my comic books. Oh. 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 Poltergeist is to the haunted house subgenre as Halloween is to the slasher movie. It wasn't the first of its kind, but it elevated things to a whole new level of style, excess, and intelligence. Coming largely from the mind of co-writer slash co-producer Steven Spielberg, Poltergeist, directed by Toby Hooper, established several tropes that have since been copied to death. The little kid who becomes the evil spirit's conduit, the freaky apparitions that haunt a youngster in his bedroom at night while mommy and daddy are snoozing, the medium and her sidekicks who move into the house to exercise the demons. The difference being, of course, that in Poltergeist, all of those story components work, resulting in an alarming show that blasts viewers with one ghoulish set piece after another. They're here. John Carpenter finally intersected with his longtime idol Howard Hawks when he remade the director's 1951 classic The Thing from Another World as The Thing, an altogether different beast that hedged closer to the original John W. Campbell short story. The film, of course, followed a crew of researchers trapped inside an Antarctic research station as a shapeshifter creature picks them off one by one. Here, Carpenter is at the top of his game, combining a colorful band of well-fleshed-out likable characters with amazingly practical effects and genuine shocks. Here, a man's chest becomes huge jaws that bite off a doctor's arm, a head disengages from a torso, sprouts legs, and eyes on stalks, and then scurries off. Throughout the thing, man and creature merge in horrific, bloody contortions that would give Hieronymus Bosch nightmares, and almost everyone dies horribly. Brilliant. You were the only one that could have got to that blood. We'll do you last. Once again, thanks for watching. And don't forget to let us know your favorite horror film of the year in the comments section below.